So uh, we need to move on to our next um, speaker is Melissa Pangelini and uh, Associate Professor of Kinesiology at IU Bloomington and uh, all in health, all in for health director. Um, and she will be presenting with Gary Ratliff, who is one of our advisory board members for all in. It's all yours. I'm gonna make sure I know how to advance my slides. So every time I present, I always feel like I have to do the Monty Python and now for something completely different because I like to take a little bit more of an uh, interactive approach. And so my interaction is mostly going to be with Gary and I'm going to split my time in a very community-based participatory way where I'll present for about 15 minutes and then I'll have a little bit of an interview with Gary to try to structure how we want to think about participation and um, provide some examples from Gary's experience as a research participant and then also as a standing member of our All In for Health Advisory Board. So today I'm going to showcase the work of my incredible All In for Health team, which is even bigger than I knew it was, <laughs> um, and provide a little bit about our vision for how we're going to increase engagement and participation in underrepresented communities throughout the research life cycle. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with All In For Health, we are a CTSI initiative whose mission is to engage public in understanding the role and value of research in improving health for Hoosiers across the state. And so we do this in a few different ways. So we have multiple different engagement platforms that we use, um, the first of which is our website. So the goal of our website is to connect Hoosiers with health information and also research study information. Our website provides individuals a link to our newsletter, which goes out each month, our volunteer enrollment registry, and then um, our study listings. So we have over 700 IRB approved studies that are listed on our website. And then we also have blog posts that showcase both participant stories engaging in health related research, and then also our behind the coat series, which um, showcases the work of researchers addressing important health topics. And the last part is we provide both national and state level health resources. In addition to our website, we also have um, our volunteer network. So right now we have 14,000 individuals across the state of Indiana. And the goal of the research network is to connect individuals across the state with research teams. So we help our researchers. The primary goal is to make sure that everyone's meeting their en en enrollment targets, both in terms of the number and also in terms of representation. And we also help to streamline this process. And I can't emphasize enough how much of a valued re valuable resource Brenda Hudson and the rest of the um, enrollment and recruitment side is in helping us to improve our reach and then also the geographic and ethnic distribution. And you can kind of see that here in the figure um, of where we are. Of course, we are very heavily distributed around the medical school and some of our other CTSI um, uh, partners. In addition, over the last 10 years, we've really engaged in underrepresented communities to try to increase their representation, both in terms of just getting our information out there through our newsletter, but also getting them to be involved in the participant registry. So here's a QR code. If you aren't part of our network, please scan and, and join our research volunteer network. And I will say, I kind of joke about this, like I'm the 0.07 of the native Hawaiian and uh, Pacific Islanders. So I can always track that one piece. In addition to our volunteer registry, we also have our newsletter. So we have 27,000 um, newsletter subscribers. This newsletter, the goal is a quick connect. So in addition to participating in research, we can also engage our community through this quick connect. And we've recently changed the format from a long lever, like long newsletter um, to our all in one minute. So the goal here is to um, have a brief format to communicate with Indiana residents. And you can see some of the language here. You know, we're really trying to embed how we communicate within the state. And then also to provide quick study snapshots. So we usually pick themes that correspond with major health initiatives across the month. Um, and so we cluster these groups into Alzheimer's disease, tobacco cessation, dietary interventions for cardiovascular disease, and so forth. Um, and then we also provide a little nudge to um, the 27,000 people um, to join the volunteer registry and become involved with our research network. 
And then we also provide links to current events. So again, we're not trying to push too much information at once. We want to onboard people into this process, provide them with relevant information, and to make this an easy and low access point. So next, we also engage in social media. So we have about 1,000 followers across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And the goal of our social media is edutainment. Okay, so people have very short attention spans. We want to get them linked in. We want to provide good health information from trusted health knowledge brokers like yourselves. And then also create visually appealing and simple ways of communicating that we're recruiting for research studies and can provide um, important information about health. So again, the goal here is to humanize us. For most people in our community, they see their clinicians or their um, the researchers as, you know, hiding and being too important to contact, but we are real people. So um, we are really trying to take an, an innovative approach to doing this by showcasing the humanity of our researchers. Why are we personally invested in the own work, the work that we do ourselves? In addition, we also try to communicate study information that's both simple and visually appealing. We might think that we can write to the, the lay public uh, I have a communications team to do that, and they do it much better than we can. And so here are two examples of some of our social media posts. One is an um, Instagram reel of Dr. Nicole Fowler doing, um, answering some questions about her research and her personal background while playing Operation. So it just is like something fun. And then another thing that we have is one of our um, Facebook ad campaigns for a study that's recruiting um, focused on taking an avocado a day. So as you can see, our information is both health relevant, right, with trusted knowledge brokers, but presented in a way that's way more user friendly than what we're used to presenting. So Gary is a member of our 18 member advisory board, um, and the goal of our advisory board is to provide new insights to the health initiatives um, and the ways that we communicate with our community, and it's also to build community champions. So as much as we need physician champions, we also need community champions and help them to talk to other community members. We have 18 advisory board members right now, but when we pulled out, when we, when they, the team, um, had canvassed those 14,000 um, participants in our research network, we had over 400 uh, people contact us that they were interested in engaging even further than just participating in a research study. So there's many, many more people that our, us as researchers can leverage to gain new insights across the entire pipeline from development to then knowledge dissemination. So we follow best practices for community engagement, and that follows, you'll see this like presented in Infogram in a minute, but the first part is to inform. So there's bi-directional information sharing between the All-In for Health leadership team and then community members. And we try to provide even time for us to have these discussions and really have every single person have an opportunity to provide impact and, imp um, and their input. The next thing that we do is we use them as our primary consultants, as representative, representatives of their constituent communities. So I'll present a strategic initiative and they'll provide me with feedback in terms of whether or not that's gonna work for the communities that they represent and what kind of potential barriers there are to um, understanding or engagement. Our advisory board also helps to shape our initiatives. They've had many different opportunities to provide us with insights as to what are important things that resonate with them. And so this infographic here um, is a word cloud of different topics that our advisory board members care about. So if you see your area here, we have a board member for you that can provide insights into that particular area. Then we also collaborate to identify new opportunities for community-based partnerships and events that might help us to um, strategically engage different research communities. And then lastly, we hope to empower our um, advisory board members so that they can be representatives of the work that we're doing in terms of all, health, all in for health and also increase knowledge and trust of research. Okay, so here's an example um, of an infographic from the principles of community engagement that I take to heart as a community-based participatory researcher. So all in for health over the last 10 years has really moved us along this continuum from informing our community, consulting with our community members, and involving them as we shape our research initiatives. 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition to how I think that we can continue moving along that pathway. And of course, this is built upon the work that Gina and Silk Soto, Santiago, and the rest of the team has done over the last 10 years. This will be just a quick glimpse of the vision in terms of growth to move towards collaboration and empowerment. So the overarching goal of our strategic initiatives is to improve not just engagement, but really bi-directional communication between researchers and community members across the research life cycle. So first, we want to really lever uh, like level up the way that we showcase diversity, both for our researchers and also for our research participants. And I'll go into a little bit more detail as to how we want to do that. Second, we want to improve the way that we communicate with community members by first simplifying the language that we use in our recruitment materials, the way we talk to them when we're enrolling them into our studies, and then also how we disseminate the information from our research studies back to those community members. We also want to increase the number of, um, or the amount of content that's in Spanish. We have opportunities here to share this information and as a first step, providing that in Spanish will help to start to engage those Latina communities that may not get this information otherwise. The next thing is building upon many different components of the CTSI, including CHEP, the Monon Collaborative, and um, Connections in Health. We want to help to elaborate community-based collaboratories and then topical collaboratories to get more of those research participants involved in the development, dissemination, and engagement um, from the start. And of course, as a researcher, um, I need to collect data. And I think it's a really important opportunity for us to understand how do we, how do each of these different initiatives, these engagement mini interventions, how do they impact knowledge of research, trust in researchers, and enrollment in research studies? So, I'm going to approach this from like an agile perspective using these opportunities as mini sprints and in collecting that data, we can get a better idea of how we can do precision community engagement that resonates best with the community members that we're trying to engage. So here are a couple different examples of how we're going to do this. So we already have a behind the code series, which has done an exceptional job of really humanizing our researchers in a way that we understand who they are and why they do their work, and then also have them as valuable resources, resources to communicate relevant health information. So here's an example of a behind the code series that was done with Dr. Nana Glatzu Miller, who's in the School of Public Health at IU Bloomington. Um, and she is just a wonderful collaborator and friend, and she cares about her community. She is the right person to put in front of a bigger audience. And so we're going to continue doing this by elevating and identifying researchers that are doing important information that are both personally connected to the research they do, but also care about community members and their role as stakeholders. Again, we want to have these um, opportunities, these engagements, both in English and in Spanish. And then through the work with my research advisory board, we want to have um, strategic in-person opportunities so that we can also disseminate the social media engagements in our in-person opportunities as well. So why is this important? My goal is to help to reduce the distance or the perceived distance that community members might have from our research community. By reducing that distance, we can build trust. We can also make sure that we remain important knowledge brokers and resources for our community members. And in doing that, we will get better long-term buy-in from our communities to participate in research. Okay. So the second thing that we want to do is to put, again, put the right people in the room, but importantly, provide them with resources to communicate better. So again, we want to create bi-directional um, interactions and, and clear communication between our researchers and our community members. And to do this, we can start creating some templates for recruitment and dissemination that makes it easier for scientists to translate what they're trying to do to engage people to come participate in their research studies, but then also understand the impact of their participation on the knowledge generalization that we have when our studies end. 
Again, building upon the work of other components of the CTSI, we want to build these topical advisory boards and collaboratories so that we can have good understanding of what that looks like from a patient side and also a participant side as we develop our research studies. And the reason why this is important is, again, we want to not just get our information out to the community, but I like to think about things as being implementable. Right? We won't understand what those barriers are until we've started to enroll and engage participants so that even if we're not thinking about intervention until much later down the road, we can start incorporating those ideas, let them marinate, and let them affect how we then create interventions moving forward. So I just want to recognize the work of my incredible team. Um, so I've only been director for two months. <laughs> so a lot of what I presented in the framework that we've had has been grown from this huge team of um, people I want to recognize, our newest member, Bonnie, who's in our communications team. A lot of the work that I'm hoping to do, especially our bilingual um, uh, content, will be on Bonnie's shoulders, no pressure. <laughs> um, and of course, we're going to vet a lot of the things that we do through our community advisory board. So Gary is an amazing represent representative of that. And of course, Deidre, Fatma, um, Angie, um, Kier, and Jordan also have contributed to everything that we do in terms of our platform, the way that we engage, and then how we have helped to train researchers. And of course, lastly, I want to thank Dr. Slick Santiago, uh, Soto Santiago, and Gina. Um, you've laid the foundation for all of the work that we do, and you remain um, a huge supporter and guidance as we move our program forward. So I'm going to transition to um, a interview with Gary. Um, I want to, before we do that, join our newsletter, join our registry, <laughs> and um, we'll, I want to introduce Gary. So, in one second. Okay. So Gary, Gary has been on our advisory board for three years, and I just want you to provide um, the group with just a brief description of your background, how long you've been participating in research, and your experience so far on the All In Advisory Board. Okay. Um, I actually come from a mental health background. I was a clinical social worker and a licensed marriage and family therapist until about 10 years ago when I retired. Um, and I've uh, I've enjoyed being a part of the uh, All In for Health. It's uh, it's a really important thing for people to do to get into research and and to be able to use that um, for us to use that um, it's it, like i said it's an experience i've, I've really enjoyed and i've uh, been a, a part of research several research studies in the past five years uh, three of those have been alzheimer's um, uh, research uh, with drugs or right now the one I'm in now is a long longitudinal study this w without any medications it's just looking at how I develop over the next few years part of the reason I did that was uh, I'm a higher risk for Alzheimer's um, I have uh, a first degree relative who had some sort of dementia which I think was probably Alzheimer's um, I have two genes that are make me more eligible and because uh, I've been in the research studies I know that I have elevated plaque in my brain so those are all three things that make me at higher risk doesn't mean I'm going to get Alzheimer's but it just means that I'm at higher risk and I'm 77 years old now and so the time is getting shorter that that might happen um, I've also participated in an online study mm -hmm. called um, it's called APT and I'm not sure what all that means but it is an Alzheimer's um, uh, it's it's like a card game. You have to look at cards and you identify them, see how fast you can identify the cards flipped over, if it was the same as another card. But that is over. I've been doing that now for about 10 years. And you just do it on the computer. They will tell me when it's time to do it. Fortunately, mine has stayed steady across the, uh, across the time, so I feel good about that. I was also involved in a cholesterol study. I had a, a mild heart attack about... Um, three years ago and um, had to have a stent put in. Um, and after, actually before I left the hospital, the clinical nurse uh, coordinator for uh, a cholesterol study in the hospital came to see me and said, would you participate in this study? And I said, sure. 
So uh, I got to participate in that. And uh, this was looking at a drug that would make cholesterol more slippery so it didn't stick uh, as bad. Um, that, that trial has another like four years to go, so I won't know the research uh, with it. But I was finished about uh, about a year ago. Um, okay. There are a few things that um, I, I see as uh, kind of problematic with getting into these studies. Um, two studies ago, I had a 40-page consent form to agree to. <laughs> And I, I know that people have to protect themselves, but the nurse had to sit and go with me through all, every page, and I had to sign it about four times, and 40 pages was long to get through. Now, I kind of knew what was coming, so I, I, I had read it ahead of time. And I, um, but it, I think for somebody new going into something like that, to be overwhelmed by a 40-page consent form is a little, a little difficult. Um, the other thing I, I've discovered is it's really important that um, the um, researchers use a very clear language with people. Uh, if you uh, tell them they're going to do something, they may not have any idea what that is. If you're, you know, what's the difference between an MRI and a PET scan or an MRI and a, or a PET scan and a CAT scan because they're different. Um, um, that one of the things that came up with me and I, I, I thought about this was that um, one of the things with the first time I was in, they told me I was going to have an LP. Well, I I knew what that was, but I could think somebody who who didn't might agree and say, oh, yeah, that's okay. And then the, he says, well, what do we do? Well, we're going to bend you over and stick a needle in your back and take out some fluid. And you're going to do what? <laughs> you know, uh, so I think that kind of being really basic with people and clarifying things is really important. Um, um, let's see. Am I getting where you want me to go? No, you're going okay. exactly where I want you to go. There was one other thing that you mentioned when we kind of did our practice interview that I think is really important for us to consider, which was um, the idea about compensation okay. and thinking about potential barriers because of compensation yeah. differences. Yeah, I have been in studies that paid me $50 per visit. That visit may be three or four hours. <laughs> and I've had those that paid me $50 an hour. <laughs> Um, that needs to be fixed, I think. You know, if you're, uh, there needs to be a more consistent way of compensating people for this. I do think we should be compensated, and I think we should be compensated fairly because we are being asked to take a risk. Uh, we don't know what these medicines are going to do to us for sure. We have a pretty good idea, but we don't always know. And it's, it's important for us to be, uh, to be informed about those kind of things. You're expecting things from us. Uh, there's a responsibility we're taking on because uh, you're going to expect us to be there for our appointments, to take the medicine like it's supposed to be taken, to report back to you the things you need to have reported back to you. And that's a responsibility you give us when, when you, uh, and those are expectations we have on, on ourselves. And I, I just feel it's really important since we're taking those kind of risks and providing that kind of information that, um, that we understand what's going on and that we get compensated for that. Um, you mentioned the simplicity of comfort of communication. That is really important too, uh, um, because w sometimes we may have a symptom that has nothing to do with what's, what the medication is, but we're worried about it, and so we ask you, and then we get some complicated explanation about it, and that doesn't help it. It doesn't really solve things. So um, uh, I, I think all these kind of things are really important. One of the things I, I would really remind you to is uh, the, the person that I have always been most connected with in the study has been a clinical nurse coordinator. She's the person I go to. She answers all my questions. I very seldom see a doctor. Um, they, uh, they give that responsibility to the nurses. Um, they schedule all my appointments. They uh, tell me what's going on. If they have a question, they answer it. And they become really vital uh, people in, in this whole process of uh, doing these things. Um, so the other thing that I wanted you to talk a little bit about was, again, about language and thinking about you as a participant, volunteer, um, and, and really putting your needs first throughout that process. 
Could you say that again, Mike? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about um, the language we use when we talk to you as a research participant or a volunteer and how important that is? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, what, one of the things will happen is people come in and they really don't know a lot about what's going on. They, they may have, um, um, know a little bit. One of the things I, I, I was thinking about today is I was reading the posters outside and I looked at those posters and I, I thought, you know, as a layperson, I don't have any idea what most of those mean. <laughs> They're using language I don't know. And so I may have, there may have some place in there had said liver. Well, somebody told me I had some spots on my liver or something. Maybe I go get this, get this tested. Well, that had, those things have nothing to do with that. Um, and so I think being explicit with us or when, when we're asked about um, the, uh, what kind of research thing we want in. I noticed that with all in thing with, on the registry, a lot of those are things I don't understand. Mm -hmm. They look kind of familiar, but I thought th if those were in a different language, I might be more likely to, to, um, to ask about them at least. Um, so I think the language is, is very important. I wouldn't use medical jargon, jargon when you're using uh, acronyms. Um, that can be very confusing because we don't know what those always are. Um, and because we don't want to look like we're, we don't know what we're doing, we'll not ask. Um, I, I'm one that does. <laughs> if I don't understand something, I'm going to ask. That's uh, so why I can find out about it. Um, I think uh, that kind of makes these things personally relevant too. Um, for me, the other things happen. I, I've always found this very interesting to do. I like doing it and got in it because I like because it was interesting. Uh, but what I uh, found out, well, initially had the, the gene testing for the for the um, Alzheimer's, and so I thought, well, I better look into this more. And I found studies to get into. But as a result of um, my heart attack, I found out I also had diabetes. I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, but they did, a, they did a sugar check and it was way high and they did my A1C and it was 8.5 and so they said we got to get this down. So that, that really gave me information I didn't have before. Um, Wonderful. With the last few minutes that we have, because I want to make sure there's enough time to ask questions. Um, Gary, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of serving on the Island for Health Advisory Board? Okay. Um, well, one of the one of the things I, I when I'm on a board like this, I want to be able to have some influence. You know, I want want to be able to do something, um, not just listen and, and those kind of things. And so for me, um, I had a, a real interest in mental health issues. I thought if that was something I could push with this board in terms of research in mental health issues, because you don't see I don't see those very often. And I'm you know from a mental health background. Um, I think I think that's one of the, one of the big things. Um, I think giving feedback about what All In for Health is doing is is really helpful. I like being on this kind of thing because it's it uh, kind of gets the message out that um, you know there are some things that could be changed pretty easily, really, um, in terms of communication and making sure uh, patients understand. Um, I think it. Um, um, it's, it's easier for me with knowing I have a chance of having Alzheimer's, I can plan the future a little bit. I can think, okay, there may be a point in time that I can't take care of myself. And uh, so right now what I do, I've done is I live in a continuing care retirement community that has Alzheimer's or memory care unit with it. I live in a condo right now, but I'll eventually, if I need the other, I've plan for that and my sons don't have to worry about, you know, if, if I'm going to need care or, or anything like that. So those kind of things, you know, in terms of um, uh, having other information that is helpful to me, that is really helpful. Um, one other thing I um, might mention to you is the, um, uh, you know, the, these, some of these diseases take months and years, or the the research takes months and years. The longitudinal study I'm in right now is five years long. Um, the one study, uh, the original Alzheimer's study I was in was going to be four years long, but they stopped it early because they found the medication was doing more harm than it was good, so they stopped it. Uh, 
and again, that's that's a good thing to find out. I mean, if I hadn't been part of that, they might not have found that out. This medication isn't really good for the disease. Um, I've had access to a genetic counselor, uh, which was really helpful. Um, there was something, oh, I think, well, we talked about that a little bit. Is that getting to what you wanted? I think you've done a lovely job. Thank okay. you, Gary. <laughs> We have, we have about seven minutes for questions, so I'd like to give the audience the opportunity to ask um, questions for our two presenters from this session. Okay, we're, okay. Good. I'm director of the health department here in Indianapolis, and so during the pandemic, the lessons we learned was especially related to vaccine hesitancy. So we're giving information now to different racial and ethnic populations. Did you find that based on the age or the gender, it makes a difference uh, in terms of how you do community engagement? Absolutely. So that is, as we've been digging into that literature and trying to understand that more, the format, the language, and the messenger all matter. And so we're trying to incorporate some of those principles of community engaged research into how we communicate effectively, and also making sure that we're putting the right people as the messengers. So in certain communities, there's a lot of work that's being done in terms of leveraging um, faith-based organizations, in terms of leveraging the YMCA, for example, in terms of leveraging people that we know are trusted health resources as helping to close some of those gaps. And so the work that we're trying to do now is to do some basic understanding of that in terms of the language use, how can we improve some of those processes, and then test that explicitly with different constituent groups. Does this language resonate with you? Do you understand it? Do you understand what you're gonna be doing in this study? And so this will be some of the back behind the scenes kind of research that we'll be doing to understand exactly that. Are, are you also looking at where they go and find their information? Like is somebody better for social media versus someone, I yeah. don't know, telephone or a friend or what? Yes, well, that, that is exactly what we're finding in the literature is that depending on the age, the ethnic group, the access to care, those, those platforms matter. But if we look at the analytics for All In For Health, we see a gap in terms of our young, healthy adults, which might work better in terms of our social media platforms and engaging them. We see a big gap in our 65 and older population. My approach will be very different for that population. Um, and could potentially align with um, other engagement opportunities in the community. So we will start thinking about that a little bit more explicitly and using data to help inform how we move our process forward, whether or not that's in-person engagements versus social media engagements and what the languages that we use during those types of engagements. Thank you. Thank both of you. Sarah? Um, thank you. This is uh, such a great panel and I especially want to thank um, our partners uh, who are non-academic <laughs> uh, for joining today and for your service um, as part of this research and in everything you do. My question is for Gary along those lines. What could we be doing more for you to give you the tools you need to do that even more if, if you so cho chose? Uh, what, what types of things could we offer you in addition to fair compensation I would add, <laughs> um, are there communication tools? Are there, I, I mean, I don't know what we don't know, and I would love your input on that. Uh, one of the things I found out in the last study I was in, uh, because it eliminated me from the study, uh, I had to have an MRI. It was the last thing I had to do, thought, several rounds of cognitive testing, and I uh, had all this other uh, blood work done, and but they had to do the MRI. And uh, they found I, out I had uh, superficial siderosis. Now, I didn't, I, any doctor I knew did not know what that was unless they were a neurologist. 
And what it was is I had a spot in my brain where there had some been, been some bleeding. Well, immediately when I got home, I looked, got on the internet to find out. And of course, I found the article that was the worst, <laughs> you know, tell me the worst thing possible. And uh, um, so when I went to see the neurologist that I had worked with on the study, um, um, he told me, he says, well, this is not that big a deal. He said the problem was the drug that they were going to test might cause bleeding in the brain, so you couldn't start out with one. And, 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 but part of, part of my problem was uh, I, I had to hunt down a neurologist that would see me. Um, my neurologist in Richmond, uh, it was six months before I could get into him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I called the neurologist that had done the study, and I got in with him in about two months, which uh, relieved a lot of worry because he said, this is nothing you don't need to worry about, but it just interferes with the study. So I think making sure if somebody has somebody uh, a condition that they need to maybe be addressed or need to be told about or consulted about, you refer them to somebody rather than say, well, here it is. <laughs> You're done. I that was that was the one thing that uh, and uh, like I said, it was it's um, uh, they said it was probably caused by a TIA I had at some point, um, but it got me out of this. But uh, I, I don't know if it will allow me to be in any other drug trials other than what I've been in simply because of that. And uh, so the longitudinal one is really makes more sense for me. That answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one minute. Okay, I just want to echo the sentiment and thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit on how All In is kind of um, engaging back with researchers too. Gary mentioned like shortening consent forms, but how, right, like as you're bridging community and um, academic researchers, what is the process of um, encouraging researchers to improve their capacity to engage with community? Right now it's Brenda. <laughs> Brenda is my guru. She does everything. She and Andy are our first line um, people that help to work with our researchers to get their studies listed and to put the information in a way that's understandable as a first step. Um, I have a plan to roll out different forms of templates, which might also include working with the IRB to try to help improve it on the front end. Um, Lindsay, who's also in our communications team, is really interested in leveraging AI. Um, Lindsay and Brenda just came back from a conference where people at Vandy have been doing this on the front end, improving the communication by simply putting in sixth grade reading level, make interesting, and then you put your study text in, and it helps to format a research flyer or a consent form that is immediately much more understandable and appealing to that research, to the potential lay community. So there are things that we can try and integrate within that process that might be lower hanging fruit. But again, I think it's important for us to think about this again as a researcher would, does this actually make a difference or does it not? And to what, to whom is this resonating? Like, how is this working? How is this not working? And so this will be a multi-stage process, but I do wanna start getting that change in immediately because at the end of the day, if your study isn't understandable and that beyond your exclusionary criteria, we're not gonna get people in the study. We're not gonna be effective for you. Great, thank you, thank you. I wanna thank both Melissa and Gary for the valuable insights that you shared and also for all the work that you're doing. Um, Thank you.